welcome you all today to the first in our Alan Turing series of lectures. This is um, quite momentous for us. The Alan Turing Institute for Data Science has um, only been running for a few months and uh, we are gradually um, uh, acquiring staff and uh, scientists and so on and the whole thing is um, coming together. So that, that's very exciting for those of us who've been in from a very early stage. And one of the things that we want to do is uh, as we explore what data science is all about, um, along with you know, many others around the world who, who are, have realized what a, a critical area this is, uh, we also want to share our, um, our community and our work with many others around Britain and elsewhere. And so we're kind of beginning to explore what it means to put on uh, different kinds of events that will draw people in to come and join us and explore data science with us. So I'm very pleased to welcome you all today and also the live uh, um, uh, webcasters um, <coughs> around the UK who are also listening to this. I'm very excited about uh, the uh, two speakers we have, Stefan Malat and Mark Newman. And uh, at this point, I'll pass over to Jared Tanner to introduce. Thanks, Jared. Thank you, Andrew. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jared Tanner. I'm the, uh, the University Connection over at Oxford. Uh, I'm also the host today for our two speakers. It's really a pleasure to have you all here today for this, uh, which is, in my view, the inaugural scientific launch for the ATI. This is the first time where we have, uh, we've gone through the process of recruiting our faculty fellows. We've been uh, recruiting the staff, those of you who are going to be the core part of uh, the senior academics making the ATI what it is, and now we begin to talk about the science. So this is uh, the beginning of a series of lectures this month and next month where we'll be talking about the science. Today's talks are going to be sort of broadly categorized as mathematics. Uh, we have two absolutely exceptional speakers today. The first of these is uh, Stefan Mala. So I've heard Stefan speak a few times over the last uh, couple of uh, years. He's been doing uh, some really exciting work on trying to understand the success of deep learning. So he's been working on a technique called the scattering transform, which gives us some better insight into why those kinds of techniques are in fact as successful as they are. Now, for those of you who don't know Stefan Mala, I'm sure that's none of you, but in case that, that happened to slip through, Stefan was one of the pioneers of uh, wavelets, of uh, multi-resolution analysis. This morning on the train right in, I was looking up Stefan and I, I got to uh, read a little bit about his, uh, the abstract from his PhD thesis in uh, Pittsburgh in 1998. I could give you a long list of, of uh, Stefan's accomplishments and awards, but I have a cold, so I'm going to sit down and I'm going to let uh, <laughs> Stefan tell you about uh, the scattering transform and deep learning. <coughs> Thanks very much, and uh, thank you very much for this invitation. It's uh, indeed uh, an amazing institute which is beginning, so I'll be uh, very interested in uh, following all the scientific output coming out of it. And uh, so I'll be beginning these lectures uh, with this uh, first lecture on high dimensional learning and on the mystery of these uh, deep networks. So behind the mystery, there are some elements that we understand a little bit many things that we don't understand, and uh, I'd like to, to go through all these problems. So, uh, let me begin with high dimensional learning. This is, let me put it on. Oh, yeah, that go, doesn't go through, okay. So, high dimensional learning. The, the basic uh, element of all these problems is that we are dealing with data which have a huge number of parameters. So the data x is being represented here as a vector. For example, image classification x will be an image. And typically an image has, let's say, about uh, a million uh, pixels, so a million variables. And in problems of classification, what we'll want to do is from x find the type of image, for example. So these are anchors, Joshua tree, beavers, different types of uh, of uh, flowers, these are typical computer vision problems. And for doing so within this uh, learning framework, you have example of images, xi, for which you do know the label, so you do know the value of the function f of xi. And the whole problem, of course, is you are going to be given a new x and you have to compute f of x. 
Now, when you look at the problem, you immediately realize that one of the big difficulty of the problem is that there is a huge variability within each of the class. I mean, a beaver can have different color, position, backgrounds, and so on. And the whole difficulty is to find what is intrinsically going to characterize the beaver relatively to the different classes. That means indirectly that you'll need to compute some invariant structures, which is specific about this class as opposed to the others. Now, computing invariants is not so difficult. What is difficult is to compute sufficiently rich invariants so that you'll be able to characterize potentially thousands of different classes. So these are typical image processing problem. Let me look at a totally different field, which is physics, for example. So if you think not anymore about classification, but regression, then your function f of x is not a, anymore a label, but typically will have its value in r. Now think now of x as being the state of a system. So for example, in astronomy, x may correspond to the distribution of mass in the universe. And what you want here to compute, for example, is the energy of the system. If you can compute the energy f of x of the system, then if you compute the derivatives, you have access to the forces, so basically to the basic physical laws. Is it possible to learn physics from data? That's what basically means. Now you can go on the other range to the infinitely small. In that case, for example, in quantum chemistry, x will be the position of the atoms and the charges, and you would like out of that to compute the energy of the molecule, and therefore indirectly have access to all the quantum forces. Now, when you look at that problem, which formally is uh, identical almost to the previous problem of image classification, there is one thing that comes out of centuries of knowledge about physics, is the importance of symmetries. The whole unification of forces was based on the fact that all the Lagrangians are characterized by their symmetries. So symmetries play a very fundamental role to analyze the property of the physical system. What we're going to see is that that comes out as also being extremely important when you deal with very high dimensional problems for data analysis. So as I suppose most of you know, the big, big difficulty of high dimensional problem is the curse of dimensionality. So if you look naively at the problem, it just looks like a simple interpolation problem. You have values xi, which are the different points. You know the value of your function f of xi. You have a new x, you'd have to know the value. So basically what you want is interpolate from the neighbors. For this to work, you need two things. You need to have close neighbors, and you need to have a function f of x which is regular. Now, in high dimension, this is never going to work. Now, why it's never going to work? Because you have no close neighbors. You have, if you have a typical x, you will have no xi which are sufficiently close. And that you can see just through these examples, two images within the same class are typically very far away. And that's the consequence of dimensionality. To understand that, just take a simple cube, 0, 1, in dimension d. If you want to sample your cube closely, let's say at a distance epsilon, then the number of points you need to cover the cube is going to be epsilon to the minus d. Now, if epsilon is, let's say, 1 over 10, which is not very small, if you are in dimension 100, that makes 10 to the power 100, and that's already more than the number of atoms in the universe. Now, we are not going to be in dimension 100, but rather 1 million. So you can immediately see that your data are going to be spread like the stars in the sky, completely isolated. No direct interpolation is possible. So the immediate reaction to that problem is to think, OK, let's try to reduce dimension. Now, think of a simple case where your function f of x, if you look at the level sets, which corresponds to the set of points where f is a constant, so for a classification problem, level set will correspond to the different classes of the problem. Now, if you are lucky enough that your level sets are perfectly parallel to a linear space, like in this very simple example, then basically you have variables which are useless that you can kill with a simple linear projector. 
and then you reduce dimensionality. You produce an invariant by killing these variables. Now, great, but that's not going to happen very often. It's not going to happen very often because a level set rather looked like that. Completely irregular, not even surfaces, absolutely not parallel to any linear space. So what can you do? One strategy to attack that kind of problem, which is very much spread in learning, is to try to linearize these classes, to linearize these level sets. So let's suppose that with a change of variable, let's dream, you can linearize these level sets. Then the only thing that you have to do afterwards is basically to do a projection, a linear projection. That, I, that idea is very standard. For example, if you take a set of nonlinear PDE, what you'll try is to find a nonlinear change of variable which is going to linearize your PDE. If you can, then it, the problem is much simpler. Basically, it's the same idea. The only difficulty is that we are in much, much higher dimension. And we don't know these level sets. We just know few points completely isolated in the space. Now, it's still, this is the dream of kernel classifiers. For kernel classifier, basically, you begin with your data, which are completely spread in the space, and you hope to have a change of variable, which by miracle is going to, let's say, regroup the elements of class one and of class zero, and are going basically to linearize these level sets. So that if you want to separate these two classes, the only thing that you have to do is a simple one-dimensional projection. So you set a hyperplane, you project orthogonally to this hyperplane, boom, by miracle, you separate everything. If you can do that, everything is extremely simple. The only difficulty is, what is the phi of x? Is it possible to find such a phi? So this phi characterized the kernel, and let's say from the 90s to 2010, something like that, people have been trying to find this kernel and progressively realized that it's an incredibly difficult problem to find a kernel which, mir by miracle, is going to linearize the whole problem. And here comes convolution network. So neural networks, as I suppose most of you know, have a long history that dates back to the 50s with the perceptron and so on, a lot of people have been working on it. I'd like just to single out one person for the revival of this uh, neural net, in particular through the architecture of convolutional network, which is uh, Yann Lequin. So let me describe the basic of, the, of these convolution neural networks. So you begin with X, and we're going to construct the change of variable progressively. You first apply a set of linear convolutions, and I'll specify that a little bit more, and you get a result, and then you apply a very simple nonlinearity. For example, the max of each of the value and zero, or absolute value of the coefficient, simple non or an arc tangent. And then you redo the same thing. You reapply a linear operator, which is a succession of convolutions, and then this simple nonlinearity and you cascade until the point you have the output of your network. This is your change of variable. Now you take this change of variable and you just apply a linear classifier over it. Now the whole idea of these deep networks is first of all, you define an architecture constraint so that you have few constraints of these linear operator L1, L2 and so on. But still, you have typically of the order of one billion variables. And these one billion variables, you are going to optimize them by trying to minimize the linear classification error by doing a gradient descent. And this gradient descent is implemented through a backpropagation, iterative algorithm, which should not converge, but does converge to very good solutions. And the result became absolutely stunning. Stunning to the point that it is completely really revolutionizing computer vision. Now there are systems, as I'll be showing, which really works very well, but not just. Speech processing, speech recognition is now done like that. Natural language. Basically, competitions, whenever you have enough training data, are almost now systematically won by this kind of architecture. 
And the question is why? Why does it work so well? There is a lot of architecture, computational know-how, very little understanding on the mathematics which is behind. And that's what I'm going to try to investigate. Now, there is an intuition which everybody shares behind, is that as you go deeper and deeper in these deep networks, there are some environments that are being built, which are, let's say, progressively higher level, and there is a phenomena of linearization which comes in together with it. And that's what we're going to try to analyze. Before, let me show you just briefly examples. So this is ImageNet, which is a huge database of about 1 million images, 2,000 classes. And that was really the first result which was very impressive on these deep networks. So in 2012, there was this very nice paper by Kriyevsky, Sustever, and Hinton. That's their deep network with the input image, that's the different layers of the network, and then the final classifier, and the results on the 1,000 classes. First layers happen to be wavelets. I'll be saying a bit more about that. Now, these have evolved a lot. Now you have networks which produce an error of about 5% on this database, which is not far from uh, visual capabilities, up to 150 layers, which are being optimized. To show you the kind of images, these are these images. So this is a mic, container ship, motor scooter, and so on. You see, very complex images with a lot of clutter, and still the network is able to perform the recognition with 5% accuracy. Uh, one of the big applications of these things are automated cars going on the street, labeling, guiding the cars, and so on. These were kind of things that we were dreaming to do still. I, about 10 years ago, I thought that was unfeasible before, let's say, 50 years. And these things are there thanks to that kind of technology. So for me, who have followed a little bit computer vision, but Andrew Blake, who is here, knows much better about it. It's really very impressive, the kind of results that uh, are being obtained. Now, there are mistakes. There are mistakes, and it's important to realize that the trial and error process can have some limitation. This is an example of images with a very little perturbation. You get these images which are visually identical, but the network goes from correctly classified to interpreting these as ostriches. Now, that's okay for images like that, but if you are flying over an airplane which is being controlled by a deep network, you'd better make sure that that kind of thing don't happen. So there are good reasons besides the interest of science for being able to understand why these networks work, how they work, reliability. Another reason is whenever you have a problem and if you don't have three years in front of you to optimize the network and so on, you'd like to understand how they work. And as I said right now, we don't understand much. Okay, so I'm going to specify a few questions. One question is, why are these networks organized as cascade? Why, what is specific about this cascade? How can we interpret that mathematically? Why convolutions are playing an important role? Why introducing nonlinearities? That's what makes the, the analysis of these networks so difficult. Is it important? What's the role of these nonlinearities? And finally, obviously, the dream is to understand what are the properties of all these operators, linear operators that are being uh, optimized. What can we say about that? So these are, the kind of, these are the kind of questions I'll be addressing through the talk. So let me come back to the concept of symmetries. What we want to do when you are in very high dimension or at least what you can't do, you can't work locally in the space. You can't work locally in the space because locally there are very, very few points. So you have to optimize global structures. Okay. Now, one of these global structures that we are going to try to understand are the level sets and in particularly the symmetry of the system. Now, you have few points. What is a level set? A level set is a set which includes all the points of a given class. To understand the geometry of this level set, we are going to look at the operators which move one point to another point of the same level set. 
In other words, it's a symmetry operator. It's an operator G, such as for any x, f of gx is equal to f of x. In other words, you, point, you move the point x to a point gx, which belongs to the same set. This is not new. I mean, all over mathematics, people analyze the structure and the geometry of object by looking at their symmetries. Now, if you combine two symmetries, of course, you still get a symmetry of the system, so you get groups of symmetries. Now, the difficulty in our problems is that we don't know what is a symmetry of the system. We just have data. The second problem, as I said, is that we are in very high dimension, so the symmetry group of the system is going to be a very high dimensional object. And that's what we're going to look at. Now, what do we want to do? As I said, we would like to linearize the level set so that then a simple projection allows to reduce dimension height. Now, what are the level sets? They are the set of points where the value of the function is constant. If you interpret that in terms of symmetries, that means that if you apply an element, an operator that belongs to your symmetry group, you remain within your level set. So you're going to have a trajectory, which is an orbit of your group. And in mathematical term, what do you want to do? You want to take these orbits, which are a priori extremely irregular curve, and you would like to linearize them, at least locally. So you would like at least to transform these level set in very smooth curve, so that then you can build projection, reduce dimension height. And what I want to show is that deep networks are able to do that kind of thing. The dimension reduction is going to go through linear projection, but the whole difficulty will be how to linearize these level sets. So to see what that means, let me take an important example, translation. If you have, for example, digit recognition problem, so you have a three, you translate your three, it's the same three. So recognition of digit is invariant by translation. But translation is not very important because translation has only two variables. So if you are invariant to translation, you go from a dimension 1 million to 1 million minus 2. You haven't gained so much. What is more interesting are the deformation. If you take a digit and you make a small deformation, so this is a deformation, the translation depends upon space, then it's the same digit. A 5 with a small deformation is still the same 5. Now, deformation are much more interesting because that corresponds to a huge group. And if you apply deformation, you can basically travel, for example, here through the whole painting of Italian paintings, just through deformations. Can you deform, can you linearize deformation? If you can, then you have the ability to have much more powerful environment for classification. Let me take a last example on the other side. Suppose you have stationary textures. So stationary means environment to translation. One big problem in math is to understand <laughs> the properties of such random fields, which are stationary random processes. It's complicated because they are not Gaussian. They are very long range dependency. They are not Markovian. Can we describe that kind of object? Again, I'll be showing that Surprisingly, these deep networks can do things. Now, these are very fundamental problems. Think of it as two-dimensional turbulence. This is a two-dimensional turbulent field. Since the work of Kolmogorov in the uh, early 50s, basically, we still don't understand turbulence. Okay. So these are completely open problem. What does it mean to linearize a random process? It basically means to transform a, a random process into a Gaussian process. Can we make a change of variable which transformed the process into a Gaussian process without losing too much specificity about the process? That's the equivalent question in the field of random uh, processes. OK, now there is one element that is going to play in our favor, is the fact that many of these problems can have a complexity which is reduced thanks to multi-scale approach, which are used all over in physics. Think of it of a system with d particle, okay, which are here. A priori, you need to incorporate all interactions. 
So you have about d square interactions in your systems, but you would like to reduce the number of interactions. One way to do it is to observe that the interactions are going to be much stronger with your close neighbors. So if these are electrostatic uh, particles, it's obvious. But it's also the case, let's say, in a neural network, uh, in a social network, sorry, where you will interact much more with your family than with friends, than with some other members of the planet Earth, OK? Now, how can you use that fact to reduce the number of variables? Used all over in physics, what you do is whenever you have more far away structures, you regroup their interactions over the particle, and therefore you create an equivalent field. For the very far away particle, you will regroup them with big groups and look at the interaction over this one so that the number of groups is just log d as opposed to d. Now, that is going to motivate me to look at the problem through multi-scale structure and to explain these cascade of filters that we've seen in uh, neural network. And that's where will appear wavelets that have been used all over in mathematics, physics, images, audio. So let me briefly summarize the idea of wavelets. The idea is in order to look at the system at different scale, we are going to send a small wave on the system. So this is a wavelet. It looks like a Gaussian, so motivate, mod, modulated sorry, by a cosine or a sine, so it's a complex wave. Now, each of these waves, which are localized as opposed to a sine, they are going to be scaled up. So you have a scaling factor 2 to the j here. And you see they are big and they get progressively reduced. And they are also going to be rotated. That's for images to be selective to different orientations, as you can see. So in frequency, basically, these are bandpass filters. When you rotate your bandpass filter, you cover a frequency analysis. When you dilate it, you cover the whole frequency plane. So the idea is we are going to take x and explode it into many multi-scale components to achieve this multi-scale look at the data by doing convolution with wavelets. And at the end, you'll get the average, which is just summarizing the low frequencies. And you can have an energy conservation. There is nothing complicated, no orthogonal basis here, just simple filter banks. Now, here's an example. You have an image. These are the different orientation components, which gives you basically the edges along different orientations. And then you cascade that to get the larger frequency structures, and so on. And already you begin to see cascade of filters a little bit like a deep net, but much, much simpler. Now, invariants. How can you build an environment, let's say, to translation? If you want to build an environment to translation which is linear, the only thing that you can do is just average it. So you can average. If you want to make a local environment to small translation, you can average a little bit. If you want to make a global invariant, you just average completely. Now the problem is you lost everything. And that's the difficulty. The difficulty is not to build environments. The difficulty is to be sufficiently rich set of environments so that you haven't lost information. So where did you lose information? The information you lost are the high frequencies. Now the high frequencies, you can recover them with wavelet coefficients. These are the fluctuation of your functions. They are oscillating like that. Now, the difficulty is that you cannot build a linear environment anymore. If you average that, you get zero. You need to put a nonlinearity if you want to have another environment. So an obvious nonlinearity is to eliminate the phase. If you eliminate the phase, you are a little bit translation environment. That's where you get the envelope. If you want to get much more translation environment, you need to average. And that's what is done here. And this gives you a new set of environments. That's very standard. In audio, that's what people call male frequency spectrum, used all over until recently. That was completely dominating the field. 
in image processing that corresponds to SIFT image descriptors, very efficient. But it only works locally. Why? Because if you average too much, you lose information. And that's where neural net will bring something. You've lost information, good. Let's recover the information that was lost. And what is lost? The high frequency of this function. So the high frequency of this function, you can recover it by getting the new wavelet coefficient, the high frequency coefficients. How? You take this envelope and you make the convolution with a new set of wavelets. And that's going to give us new layers. And you have a new set of coefficients. Let's look how it looks like. This is the first tree of wavelet coefficients. And the idea is these coefficients, to make them invariant to translation, you can average them, but you can also compute all their wavelet coefficients and average them. Now, these coefficients, you can repeat again, computes their wavelet coefficient until the point all the information has gone down the tree, everything is invariant. So vertically, basically, you have a scale parameter. And down, you have all your invariant, which are a whole cascade of first order wavelet coefficient, a second one, a third one, and so on, and at the end, the averaging. Okay? You see that the nonlinearity is very important here. Now, mathematically, how it looks like? Mathematically, in this very simplified network, and I'll be showing in what sense it's very simplified, there is no connection between filters, I'll be speaking about that. This simplified network, which outputs all these invariant coefficients, are a cascade of a first wavelet transform modulus, a second one modulus, a third one, and so on. Now, all these operators, they preserve the norm. The absolute value, it's a contractive operator because it kills the phase, so it brings closer coefficients. So the modulus of a wavelet transform is a contractive operator. You are cascading contractive operators. It is therefore going to be contractive. So the first result is that this vector, if you look at the distance for x and y, always going to be smaller than the distance between x minus y. Good, stable. Second thing, you can prove that it's going to converge. The last layer goes to zero. What it means, it means that all the energy is going to be transferred into something which is completely invariant. And that's very important because basically you can have a hope to reconstruct something relatively rich. Last thing, which is really what motivates us, is you linearize deformations. And why you linearize deformation? Because wavelets are very small. You deform a little bit of wavelet, it looks like a wavelet. The key point, basically, the wavelet transform almost commutes with deformations. And if you want an operator which does that, you don't have the choice. You need to separate scales. Stability to deformation implies multi-scale, basically. And the result is that the scattering transform of your signal, if your signal is a bit deformed, is going to look like the transform of your original signal, and the distance is going to be of the order of the size of the deformation. So, what can you do? You can do recognition out of that. So if you begin with a simple problem like digit recognition here, so you have a set of digits. For each digit, you compute your deep networks, which are just with wavelet filters, so there is no learning here. And out of this vector, then you just learn a simple linear classifier. So your change of variable here is this scattering transform here. If you apply that to digit classification, you basically get state-of-the-art result. The order, uh, so this is a database called MNIST. The error is of the order of 0.4%, like what convolution net can do. The only thing is that convolution net are going to learn everything. So you can view it two angles. The spectacular thing of convolution network is that they don't know about wavelets, they learn it, they learn everything. On the other hand, you can say, why learning? In that case, I know the group. I know that my group is translation and the diffeomorphism group. I don't need to learn. I know that you need to separate scale, and I know what are the filters that are going to be wavelets. Another problem where translation is the main thing, stationary processes. So this is a texture classification problem. Here, 
you have different texture. This comes from a database of textures. And you are given one texture, and you want to know which random process it corresponds to. So there has been many approach, but let's say the standard statistical approach is to work with second order moments. You cannot go to higher order moments because too much variance. You have a single or very few realization to build a model of your process. And if you do the same thing then for digit, just compute a scattering transform and just apply a linear classifier, you get a very big improvement here about a factor of five compared to second order moments. I would like to stop one second on that because it's a good case to try to understand what's happening. In this case, the images are all realization of a stationary process, x of t. Now, if you take a stationary process and you make a convolution and a nonlinearity like an absolute value, that stays stationary. If you make an averaging, it stays stationary. So all these things are, all these components are stationary processes. You have basically a vector of stationary processes. Now, if you average a stationary process and you have a little bit of ergodicity, this is going to converge to the mean. It's going to, central limit theorem will tell you, in fact, it's going to converge to a Gaussian process centered on the mean with a covariance that is going to go to zero. So because of the averaging, you basically Gaussianize your process. Have you lost a lot of information? That's what we're going to see. So the expected values that what I call here the scattering moments, these are just like second order moments, but expected values of a very much more nonlinear functional, which is also contracted. So the variance is going to go to zero. Let me show you example. So what you see here is an original texture. This is a Gaussian model of this texture. So it has exactly the same second order moment. Nice model. And that's what you would get with a scattering transform. So here, I'm just going to keep the first and the second order coefficient. So the number of moments is log n squared. Now a different example, much more geometrically structured. This is the Gaussian model. This is a model which is basically a Gaussian process, but in the scattering domain. We just simulate a, a Gaussian process in, in the scattering domain, and that's one typical realization. And you see that you capture the geometry because you've captured them through multi-scale interaction across angles. These are rocks. Again, you see the non-structured Gaussian models and turbulence. And you see this is the Kolmogorov model. This is basically a deep network model of turbulence, and you see the geometry of filaments. It's not a perfect model, but you see appearing through these cascade of nonlinearities much more accurate, high order uh, models of these uh, textures. I'm going to show you the same with audio. I don't know if that's going to work. This is a Gaussian model that you see here. This is with audio wavelets. And you hear the intermittence. Paper, Gaussian paper. Exactly same second order moment. And that's what you hear in this A cocktail. Gaussian and scattering. OK. Now, why are deep networks much more complicated and much more rich? Because deep networks don't just do convolution. They do convolution across multiple channels, and they recombine all these channels. And the question is, what is the role of this combination of channels? It's very, very important. That's where you have access to other symmetries than just translation. Convolution just deal with translation. You want to deal with much more complex symmetries. Think, for example, of rotation. That will be relatively easy. When you build your wavelet transform, you are creating a new axis, which is an angle axis, because all your wavelets are rotated. If you want to do invariance to rotation, then you need to do the same thing that you did on translation, but on rotation. So the convolution in space, now you want to replace it by also a convolution along this rotation angle. So suppose, for example, you just did something along translation with a wavelet transform. You have your signal x, 
you made a convolution with a simple wavelet. If now you rotate and translate, your output is going to be translated and rotate, and the angle is going to be shifted. So you want to kill this shift. If you want to kill this shift, you need to build an invariant along the angle. And for doing that, basically what you did on translation, you want to do it on a bigger group, on the group of roto translation, rigid movements. So you're going to do convolution with wavelet not just in space, but also along angles to do an invariant on your more complex group. Formally, it's the same, but now you're dealing with a bigger group. I'm just going to show you an application to physics. So in physics, a lot of problems are invariant to rigid movement. If you want, for example, to compute the energy of a system, let's say in this case it will be in quantum physics position and charge. If you want to compute the energy of a molecule, if you rotate the molecule, the energy doesn't change. So the energy is invariant to rigid movement. It's also stable to slight deformation. So it almost looks like an image processing problem. Now, how do you compute normally the energy with a computer in quantum chemistry? The way, so basically you need to solve the Schrodinger equation for a very high large number of particles, which is the number of electrons. The way this is done is by trying to compute an aggregated variable which corresponds to the density, the electronic density of the molecule, which I'm showing here. So what you see here are two molecules, and what are being displayed is the de electronic density. So what is the probability of finding an electron at a particular location? Now what you see is that the electrons are delocalized between the nucleus, and what, that is what brings all the nucleus, bind them together, this is where you get the chemical property of your molecule. What do we want to do? We would like to basically learn that just from data. Okay? We don't know anything about Schrodinger, we just have data and we want to learn basically quantum chemistry in these particular molecules. What are we going to do? We're going to take, we know the charge. So we're going to suppose that the charge don't interact. So the charge are just independent blobs. Okay. And now what we're going to learn is the interaction with a deep network. So how do we do that? Basically, you want to find a change of variable which has the same invariant than your system, invariance to rotations, and stability to deformation. So you're going to build a change of variables. What physicists would typically do is compute a Fourier transform and a modulus. That's good for invariance to translation, but it's not stable to deformation. Once you have your change of variable, we are going to learn the regression coefficients. And in physical terms, these re regression coefficients, they are the equivalent potential of the physical system. So here we are just going to learn them from the data. So you begin from a database, 4,000 molecule, from which you compute your regression. And we're going to try to have a very sparse regression so that a minimum number of coefficient explains the phenomena. Now, this is the error, log of the error, as the function of the number of terms. If you use a Fourier transform, the error goes to about 14 kilocalorie per mole, whereas numerical computation gives you an error between one and three kilocalorie per mole. If you use the high order terms of the scattering transform, the error goes down to about 1.8 kilocalorie per mole. And the number of terms is small, like 600. The dictionary initially is very big, about 10,000 coefficient. But only 600 in that case is enough. And what are there? They give the interaction, multi-scale interaction terms, which reflect the very fine structure of the interaction, but the very large structure, like the van der Force. Van der Waals forces. So we don't understand why, but obviously these kind of things are able to regress physics. Now, does it work for object classification? Not so well. If you take an object classification problem like this one, and you apply exactly the same thing, no learning, the error is about 20%. That's what you do with an unsupervised technique. So it was about the state of the art 
in 2010. If you use a deep network, boom, the error goes down by at least a factor three. Somewhere, what does it mean? <laughs> They've learned some structure that goes well beyond this simple invariance on geometry. And the question is, what is this structure? There are very impressive results. You can learn a network, which is shown here. This is a very beautiful paper, where you basically learn images that have the same statistics than the images that are sampled that you provide to the system. They did that with faces. And what they observed is that the network is linearizing very complex phenomena. So, if you take the vector which characterizes one face, the vector which characterizes a second one, a man, and the third vector which can reconstruct a woman, if you do a simple linear combination of these vector, the man with the, the glasses minus a man plus the woman, you get a woman with glasses. That means basically you linearize this thing which is gender, you linearize this thing which are glasses. If you do the same thing directly on the data, the image you get is completely nonsense. If you train these networks on bedrooms, and you take the vector of one bedroom and the vector of another bedroom, you do a linear interpolation and you reconstruct, you get intermediate bedrooms. And that's very impressive because a bedroom has a bed, has very complex structure that somewhere these networks have been able to capture. So that means the kind of symmetry they capture is much, much more sophisticated than diffeomorphism, translation, rotations. From there, there's plenty of open problem. It's obvious, obvious, it's not intuitive, but it comes out from the numerics, that these networks are able to <coughs> linearize very complex nonlinear transformations, well beyond things like diffeomorphism, which are already relatively complicated mathematically. The operators which are there, they also are able to progressively reduce dimension. Because once you've linearized a phenomena, you can reduce the dimensionality. And then go to a more complex phenomena, reduce the dimensionality. So the complex thing is that these operators do many things at the same time. Another thing that is very characteristic, these operators store memory. They are able to store patterns. And that's very important because some patterns are relatively close and you may collapse them together by trying to build a symmetry. To avoid that, you need to have some kind of memory storage, which at least is observed within these networks. So there is a lot to learn. I mean, what I basically described was a justification of why these networks, within the framework of, let's say, geometric symmetries, and you can go so far with it. But obviously, there is much more with it. So I'd like to conclude uh, here, first of all, by saying that the results of these networks are really, truly spectacular. I mean, the, the, they, they are really improving a lot the state of the art of many different fields where you have high dimensional approximation problems. They seem to be able to compute high level hierarchical environments, but again, the mathematics is really not clear. They are used nowadays as models in physiology of vision, audition, at least by a number of researchers. So it goes even beyond that data analysis. And personally, I think that they are very close link with particle physics, with statistical physics, where all these fields which are basically about understanding how to find symmetries and take advantage of these symmetries to build environs of the system from these uh, symmetries. So there are many very outstanding mathematical problems. You need to define a notion of complexity. How come these problems can be solved despite the curse of dimensionality? It means that the function that we are learning have some kind of regularity. What is the source of regularity that is being exploited? What are the approximation theorems which are behind? What is the general notion of complexity? All these problems are completely open. So that's the kind of problems that could be studied by interested researchers in this institute. Thanks very much.
Uh, is there anyone who would like to begin with the questions? If not, I will. So when, when I was listening to you speak, one of the, the analogies that kept coming to my mind was the early work on dictionary learning, where people would take dictionary learning and they would optimize, optimize, and what would come out would be something that when they looked at the elements, it was reminiscent of what they anticipated. It looked like a wavelet representation. So you're learning invariance in some sense, some kind of global structure. Um, are there examples where people are looking at what they've learned and, and seeing something that they would have expected to have found? Okay, so when you look at the filters at the first layer, there are wave lights in many, many problems. Like all these image processing <laughs> problems, basically there are wave lights. When you look at the filters, and we looked at them a lot, at the deeper layers, they are not anymore just simple wavelet because they're not just spatial. These filters are recombining many channels. And when I say many channels, it can be of the order of 100 channels. And then it gets very complicated to, to analyze them. We tried. It's very complicated because the coefficients are completely disordered. You don't know what is the meaning of these channels. They are not just simple angles or scales or things like that. So basically, <laughs> if you just look at the data, you don't see anything. You need a mathematical model to then check whether your math model is there or is not there. But just looking blindly, you don't see anything. That's why when you look at the papers, no paper tries to interpret exactly what are these coefficients besides showing few images. There are nice papers which show few images which show it can detect that kind of thing or that kind of thing. But there is no real interpretation of the filters. And you have to realize that there are nowadays, I suppose, of the order of 10,000 or more. Uh, there are people all over working on that, trying to do startups, trying to do things. Nobody came out with a way to analyze it, which shows that it's a difficult problem. Other questions? Yes. Please. Yeah. Um, I think uh, sort of the deep convolution network is quite tough. Uh, a broad area and it's sort of evolving over time. I think one of the questions I want to ask about is about your neurons in terms of where you then did a log normal, uh, you <coughs> refined it, and then you did sort of a log normal where you had a function and you had the max uh, between the function of x and up to zero. I, I think, from my opinion, it looks like you're sort of converging the data to a subset, and in the, in the, in the process, you had sort of a good curvature that came out of it. Now, is this the expected behavior every time you do this, or you, you, you have room for broader spectrum. Uh, I'm not sure I understand fully the question, but I'll try to still uh, answer. Uh, one thing is that the architecture of these networks have been simplifying. A lot of these networks were using max, max poolings and so on. If you look at the last networks that got the state of the art on the big problem, no more max, just a succession of filters, linear rectifier, max of u and zero, filters, linear rectifier, and at the end, no classifier, just the max gets you directly, uh, the um, soft max gets you di directly the class, to the class. So the architecture is now getting simple in the way it's described, much more layers. And so uh, the log normal, I'm not sure, they, I mean, many of these networks don't use any log in their, uh, in their models. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure what you are referring to. Well, you've got from the non-linearity. Yes. Uh, tiny function. So basically, uh, when you put the function in the same max of zero, you're assuming uh, a log normal state whereby nothing goes below zero. Yeah? That, that's what I mean by log normal in terms of... Okay. Uh, so okay, from my point of view, the max... And, and in fact, we've been... That, these are experiments that we did. Replacing the linear rectifier by an absolute value and retraining, you basically get the same results. Not as efficient, but very close. So for me, the linear rectifier is just killing the phase. And in fact, in electric uh, circuits, how do you recover uh, a DC component of a current? You do a linear rectifier and an averaging, you get exactly the same result than an absolute value and an averaging. So for me, the linear rectifier is doing a killing of the phase. The whole problem is to understand how you build the linear operator so that you build 
the kind of phase you want to kill, which builds the kind of invariants you want to kill. When you kill the phase, that's where you build an invariant. The beauty is that you have the full freedom to rotate the space, build a different space, to build a different type of phase that you can kill. How you do it, how do you optimize that? What's the mathematical meaning? That's the question. Patrick? So uh, we did have one question come in from afar, as it were. Uh, it's a classic question about overfitting. And I guess there are two ways this, this question could be interpreted. So the question is, how, do, how, how can you prevent overfitting in examples such as the ostrich one that you showed? And I guess I would ask the question in two ways. I mean, there's the, the technical question about regularization and how one thinks about regularization in this context. But there's also the more practical question of, of um, algorithmic, uh, algorithmically, I guess, if you like, independently of whatever theoretical frameworks we're talking about, how does one sort of um, understand and guard against overfitting in this, in this context? So that's very important. Indeed, there is a kind of strange thing. These networks have billions of parameters, and there looks like there is no overfitting. Now, there is one reason in particular. These networks are contractive. So if you look at the nonlinearity, it's contractive. The problem of that mistake it, you see, if your, each of your operator have a norm smaller than one, they are going to be contractive, and you are going to have no explosion. In this case, some of the operators had a norm bigger than one, and when you were cascading these operators with a very small error, boom, you got a big error. One way to avoid that, which we do with the wavelet transform, but you can do in general, is to make sure that your operator have a small, smaller than one, and then you just contract, so you cannot overfit. Why do you have a fit with a polynomial? Because the polynomials are <laughs> incredibly expanding. So you have a lot of degrees of freedom, but your noise is exploding and you get a huge, your variance increase. One thing that you are guaranteed with these uh, network, if the norm of the operator is smaller than one, is that the variance reduces. So you don't have an overfitting in that sense. Very interesting, thank you. Yes. Further questions? There's one here. Andrew. Um, well, I suppose one of the things that has made deep neural networks very influential recently, because I mean the, the sort of fact of their existence has been known, but the breakthrough perhaps is that people have found out how to train them. And the training, you know, different people have different recipes, stochastic gradient descent seems to be used a lot. The explanations of what is happening in training seems rather intuitive, shall we say. I mean, it's, it's approached very experimentally. So do you have any uh, optimism that we will understand better how training works? Okay, that's another beautiful area of research. Indeed, these trainings are basically implemented through stochastic gradient descent. So that means that when they arrive to local minima, they are stuck. And how come these local minima are relatively deep so that the solution seems to be good? One interpretation, but it's a completely hand-waving interpretation, is that in very high dimension, you are very likely to arrive to saddle point so that there is always one direction where you can still go down if you know how to move enough so that you will be able to go down. Uh, there are some recent work on models with spin glasses that have been done to illustrate that. But it's, comp it's really open. And that's indeed a big surprise. The big surprise was that, uh, as you were saying, really algorithmically, nothing is really new. It's the same kind of algorithm that people were using, in particular, uh, Yann Leca and his networks uh, in the early 90s. But what's happening is that when you have enough training data, it looks like you get out of these saddle points and you can learn. And that's open. The, this is another very wide class of optimization problems which are widely open and very interesting.